I believe I am the one to start. I'd like to welcome all of you to the September 2020 Green Burial Council Peer-to-Peer -peer Forum. Um, it's uh, my first forum, so I'm excited to be here. Um, I am a, a fairly new member of the Green Burial Council's board, uh, Jane Black, and I'm in Portland, Oregon. And um, so uh, there are so far, as Susan mentioned, we had over 100 signups. We have almost 50 people on the call right now, which is great. It really uh, speaks to the growing demand for the service and for the education about the service, which is what our organization is about. Um, I would like to do a shout out to those of you who were kind enough to uh, donate to the organization when you uh, made your reservation for the event tonight. We really appreciate it. Um, it is, we are a 501c3, so we are looking for funding to uh, serve our educational mission. Um, I did want to mention, as, as Anne said, that we are recording tonight, so you will be uh, live, not live, but on our website later on, um, just so you know. And um, Anne uh, introduced herself. She's listed as Edward Bixby on the screen, but she's really Anne Weston from North Carolina, and she is a former board member and volunteer and a very dedicated advocate in North Carolina. Um, and she's going to be muting you all, um, and that will allow us to do the question and answer um, after the speakers have had a chance to tell you uh, some things, they are going to go first. And then uh, any question or comment that you have, you can just put into the chat box, which you'll find on the bottom bar. Uh, if you click on that, it'll come up and just make sure it's going to everyone. Um, and then I will monitor those and ask your questions for you after the presenters have had a chance to talk. Um, Anything that we don't get to, we will uh, address in an email that will come to you afterwards along with uh, links to resources that are discussed. And uh, we won't be using the raised hand function tonight, so you can, you can use it if you want, but no one's gonna call on you. Um, I, uh, I just wanna say thank you again for being here and introduce Susan Greer, who is a fellow board member and who did the lion's share of putting together this, this program tonight. Um, she is coming to you from Ontario, Canada, where she works with the Natural Burial Association. Thank you, Jane. Um, I just, and I just wanna quickly say, I just got an email from Josh, who's one of our speakers, one of the cemetery operators, and he can't get on. So I don't know if there's anything we can do. I'll quickly change, send you his, sorry, there's gonna be a little bit of a technical, um, glitches just at the very beginning, and then you've got his email now. Um, so you've joined us probably for three reasons, either because you operate a conventional cemetery and would like to create a green burial section, or you're a funeral director or community advocate who'd like to see a green burial ground in your community. So tonight we're going to hear from your, all those peers, and each speaker will share their perspective on creating or advocating for a hybrid. Our lineup of speakers includes three hybrid operators, that's if we can get Josh on, he's from Utah, followed by two funeral directors, and lastly, a green burial advocate. But first, Candace Curry will set the stage for us because defining exactly what a hybrid is, is a little more nuanced than you might think. Uh, previously on GBC's board, Candace remains uh, an invaluable volunteer, certifying the green burial grounds for the GBC Cemetery Certification Program. While she was employed at Mount Auburn Cemetery in Cambridge, Mass., the cemetery received its green burial hybrid certification. And as a member of the Green Burial of Green Burial, Massachusetts, Candace was instrumental in the uptick of local cemeteries from one in 2014 to over 20 today. And these allow for you know the green burials within their conventional cemeteries. Candace, over to you. Great. Thank you so much. Oh, look at that. Sorry, I'm trying to share my screen.
Sorry, Anne. We're not getting there. All right. Let's, let's try something else. Whoa. Still see. Oh, I'll get going with it without it. We'll uh I'll I'll talk through my slides. Uh, so I'm thrilled to have everybody here tonight. I think hybrid burial grounds are the key thing for the entire continent to be able to offer green burial to people. It's what most people will have access to. So I think this is so fabulous that we had such a response to this peer-to-peer -to -peer forum tonight. And for those of you who are cemetery managers, you might think, oh my goodness, I have a new client who just came in and they say they want to have a green burial. And so maybe you're thinking of a beautiful meadow or maybe you're thinking of a, a wooded landscape and you have a landscape lawn cemetery. It's not a place where you think you can offer green burial. <clears throat> Instead, you figured out that you have a new section where you're gonna grid out and put new concrete liners in or maybe a vault. And that, as you know, is not green burial. However, don't give up hope. There are basically two ways to create a hybrid cemetery. And that could be infill, integrating green burial graves into an existing landscape. And in the green burial world or in the cemetery world, those would, would have been called pauper's graves here in New England. Or you could create a new section, I create a green section that's adjacent to or within an existing conventional cemetery. So there could be upright markers. There may be difficult space to maneuver and so getting a backhoe to install a grave box may not even be possible in some areas of your conventional cemetery. However, if you could get a smaller piece of equipment or even shovels to dig a, a grave, it's possible to put some of these infill graves in areas that you can't currently put in a grave box or a grave liner. So infill graves, that's one method of creating your hybrid cemetery. The other is, imagine you have adjacent property, and maybe you walk through your conventional cemetery and it opens up to a wooded area. Well, instead of actually cutting down all those trees, you could actually have forested burial location. And there's plenty of people who would find that very, very appealing. And if, it, you, if you can't find the density of burials that you would like in that new section, maybe there's at least a grove or some section of trees that would be important to keep. So you can make a compromise there. And congratulations, you're really lucky if you have that extra land where you can build that, that new section. There's a cemetery up in Schenectady, New York called Vale Cemetery. They had a conventional cemetery and there was about an acre of space without um, with just weedy space that they wanted to do something with. They had it designed for green burial, and it's a wildflower meadow. It's absolutely stunningly beautiful. And so sometimes when you think of a hybrid burial ground and green burial, you think, ah, I won't get to use my lowering device anymore. Well, in fact, you can use a lowering device you can allow a family member to hit the button so that the casket does slowly lower down into the grave. Or human beings can be using a rope to help make that happen. So the Greenville Council advocates participation from the family and friends. It doesn't mean it's void of all mechanical implements. The other key thing is to let the family be involved with typically covering the grave. It actually serves the, the family. It's cathartic to be part of that process, to be doing that, that physical activity is actually helpful. And so then the grave is filled and oh my goodness, there's a mound of soil. What am I gonna do with a mound of soil in my landscape 
lawn cemetery. Well, you don't have to have the mound of soil. There are cemeteries that use that so that as the body decomposes and the casket um, collapses, the, the soil, the mound of soil will also subside, but it's not a requirement to use a mounded grave within a green burial ground. So it's just as easy to create a landscape lawn look to it. The key thing about it is that everything going into the grave is biodegradable from the clothes the person is buried in to perhaps the shroud they're wrapped in to the soft pine box or maybe the wicker casket that they're buried in. It's all biodegradable. We are all designed to decompose. That's what the green burial is about, letting us decompose naturally. And nothing toxic. There's no toxic embalming fluid. There's no grave liner or vault. And even inverted vault is not there. And as the person who does the compliance of the hybrid cemeteries, as well as the natural and the conservation cemeteries, it's important for me to see that the family and friends can participate and that there's a, a section in your operations or maintenance manual that says how the green bur burials will be handled. And if you don't even have a maintenance manual, you at least need something for how the green burials are handled. And also, at least 10% of sales need to go into an endowment to help ensure the long-term sustainability of the cemetery. So that's a, a quick view of hybrid and a little bit about the GBC certification of hybrid cemeteries. And it's, it's, um, it's, it's, it's beautiful, it can be done. And I think hybrids, as I said at the start, have a real chance to make uh, a major impact with the residents of your towns where you where you reside it's a it's it's becoming more and more uh meaningful to people to be involved in this way and hybrid your local town municipal cemeteries have a chance to do that so um, i will hand it over back to susan again and uh Thank you, Candace. It's true, we think of it as being something environmental, but the rituals that occur in natural burial that don't occur in the conventional burial are extraordinarily meaningful to the family. So thank you for bringing that up. Is Patrick with us? Patrick Healy? Are you out there? Yes, he is. It says Lori. Oh, it does. Okay. All right. <laughs> uh, now we're going to hear from three different hybrid operators. The first one, Patrick Healy. Um, initially, my understanding is that Patrick, Patrick was rather skeptical about green burial, but he is now one of its greatest advocates. He's the director of Green Mount Cemetery in Montpellier, Vermont, where he's been for over 30 years. As well, he's the president of the Vermont Cemetery Association and has served on the New England Cemetery Association. Patrick, over to you. Okay, um, great. Thank you for having this. Um, so I'll give you a little background. Um, as uh, Susan said, I've been uh, a director for 30 years of a conventional cemetery. Cemetery started 1853. And um, we could have been a, a uh, green burial back then because they were just pine boxes um, planted and the land had to be planted thickly with trees because the person that donated the money uh, to buy the cemetery land wanted it planted thickly with trees because in Vermont at that time, there were no trees, the very little trees, mostly sheep farms. So everything was cleared. So fast forward, um, we're also seven miles from Barry um, granite quarries, the, the granite, what they call the granite capital of the world. So we have a lot of monuments and that was something that we, we always have to take into consideration when we're designing new sections. So when the green burial um, movement started or when they started to change, they went to the, uh, or legislative changes to burial depth. And um, keep in mind, my cemetery is only one mile from the Capitol building. So I could easily go down and talk to the legislators and, and argue that this may not be a good idea. Um, wanted to know everything about it and got very little um, 
response from the people that were pushing through the, the burial debt. Um, we, we as a cemetery association uh, were concerned from everything from smells to animals digging it up. Um, and um, so we needed to know how it was done. We have a clay soil, the, and I did a lot of research on soils and if you, you know, they're, and they're, they do research around the world about bodies um, decomposing, not so much human, but uh, pigs and stuff. And I found it in, uh, I think it was Germany, that they were having issues of digging the bodies back up after 20 years. And what they were finding was what was called grave wax. And it's, a, the body doesn't really decompose because of the clay soils. Well, we have clay soils. So I, we had to figure out what do we use for a backfill? What are we doing? Um, how do we do this? Is it really going to work? Um, and I finally said, sure, um, let's, let's give it a try. I had a commissioner uh, on, on the board of directors and, and uh, her husband was a doctor and he was dying and they wanted a, a natural burial, but it was going to be in the conventional part of the cemetery. Wicker basket, we did it. We, um, at that time, the depth law was five feet, but they've now changed it to three and a half feet. And we're slowly, we're about three foot 10. We're, we're almost to the next burial we will probably do at three foot six, but I wanted to see for myself um, that there were no problems with animals digging up and or smells. And I think we can probably do the three foot six depth. Um, what we're doing is we're backfilling with a mixture of sand and compost um, because we have a lot of um, trees in the cemetery. We, we take our leaves and we make compost. So then we just got some sand in and we're mixing that and the whole grave shaft will be the sand compost mix. Hopefully it will help get the um, bodies to start to compost as fast as possible. Our other concern was winter time. What do you do in the winter time? Um, now we get enough snow so the ground really doesn't freeze where their snow is. But as soon as you take the snow off, the ground's gonna freeze. And my concern was if you put the body in at three and a half feet, is it gonna be frozen solid for a couple months until springtime? And so we figured out that what we'll do is take bales of hay and just line them up on top of the grave um, to do this, to, to make sure that the ground doesn't freeze. Now, we took a section, we've done a couple in our conventional portion of the cemetery, and most people don't know we're doing it there. Um, but we took a section of our cemetery that's on a hillside and we were mowing it because we assumed someday we would have regular burials there. Um, and so what um, we did was we said, okay, we'll call it the orchard. We put in some apple trees and we're trying to put wildflowers in, but with COVID um, situation this year, my main workforce is the Department of Corrections. We have an inmate crew of eight to 10 guys that come down every day or did for 30 years, this year they didn't. So we're behind on putting in wildflowers. Um, but we, are, we, we have started it. Um, I am a, a, a believer that you can do that with um, conventional um, monuments. Um, we actually, because of our work crew not coming this year, most of our cemetery we let grow. And the uh, response was fantastic. Um, because most of our cemetery is on a hillside. It was designed in 1852 for, uh, before they even had lawnmowers. So we were, we were kind of a nice spot to try this out. People like the long grasses. And so what we're trying to do is uh, starting to prepare it for the winter and we're gonna try to get everything mowed down. So the new section, we, we were just, um, we're trying to figure out all the logistics of design. We're making the lots big um, because we've never done this before. It's hard to, I don't want to be digging into another grave shaft of another person. It's, it's easy. 
I'll say it's easy to hit a concrete box with your, with your backhoe or your excavator and you say, oops, and then you just, you dig next to it and you're all set. But we do not want to invade that, uh, that grave shaft. So we've made them a little bit bigger and, um, we, we feel that we've got the size down. Um, we're not trying to maximize the space or the use of the space. And like I said, we were using a backfill of sand and compost. And we had to, t uh, so we've done like six in this section starting last January, um, no problems with anything. And the backfill, we've had to backfill them each a couple times, but we'd rather keep them level so that we can find out what's going on. Um, and so that's where we're at. Um, lowering device is, we bought one because we thought we'd need one, um, but we've come to making a, a board. We had some pine trees come out of the cemetery. We had them milled into rough cut lumber and we're just using uh, rope, tying them to the boards and then allowing the family or whoever's there to, to lower the body. Um, so we're doing, doing that. Um, and response has been good. And we do, uh, the one rule is that all mark, all graves will be marked with a granite marker, which is flush on the ground. So when we go through in the fall to cut the, the, the grass and the, and the wildflowers down, we at least know who's there and, and, and exactly where they're at. Um, so that's about how, how I got started. Um, and yes, I was totally skeptical and now I'm like, wow. This, this really could work. And it's, it does save a lot of time and effort on our part to dig a grave. Um, we don't have to use, well, we do use a, a mini excavator, but it just takes so much less time. Excellent, thank you, Patrick. There's so many things I hear about zoning and um, marketing, but I was not expecting to hear about soil. That's super interesting. Um, now I would like to introduce my favorite green burial hero, and that is Mark Richardson from Niagara Falls, Canada. Um, and he was an environmental studies major at university and was working for the city, the municipality of Niagara Falls, and then was um, asked to run the cemeteries. Uh, there wasn't a green one, and he didn't like that. And Mark, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, first and foremost, I'm really happy to be uh, a part of this evening. Uh, it's great to speak to like-minded individuals um, and to share stories. And I'm going to echo a few uh, sentiments that Candace started off with. I'm going to try to get through it as quickly as possible. Um, one about community involvement and how we developed our green burial section in, uh, in a conventional uh, cemetery. A Fairview Cemetery is the largest in Niagara Falls at 77 acres. And back in 2016, sorry, before 2016, I started approaching council asking for capital funding to develop a green burial site. Um, but it wasn't a priority of council at the time. Um, so I kind of turned the tables a little bit and I spoke to the community and I told the community what, what we had in mind and the community loved the idea. And so this was in fact a community dr a driven project. Uh, we had environmental committees that uh, passed motions uh, encouraging the development of the green burial site. Um, we also had not-for-profits that uh, gave us money um, through donations and through grants in order to make this possible. And so what we were able to do was take two acres of our existing cemetery. It was originally an area that was a, a leaf compost pile. Uh, so in speaking about the soil, it was incredibly rich and ready for development. Um, and we took that two acres, which was already encompassed or, or surrounded by some mature trees, and we just started simply by working with some volunteers and planting 75 trees to create a bit of a barrier. And once we had that grant money and that community support pouring in, we were able to plant 15,000 wildflower seeds and plugs, um, which is one of the picture that is, is, is my backdrop. This is uh, Willow's Rest, aptly named... Uh, because of the l large willow in the background. And actually, if I can share my screen, I may be able to, uh, I can show you some of the images while I'm speaking. 
Uh, let me know, is this, uh, is, is my screen showing? Yep, perfect. Excellent. Um, so this is the gateway feature. Um, what we wanted to do was develop an area that people could escape, um, that they could walk through a gateway and eventually be surrounded by nature. It was a, a feeling that I experienced when I tour, toured one of the uh, natural burial grounds in uh, Western Canada, uh, that being Denman's Island. And I wanted to bring that to Niagara Falls and provide that option and availability to everyone in Niagara Falls and, and throughout Southern Ontario. So the screen that I have up now, just as a, a simple illustration of the design of the two acres, it is laid out in a uh, standard uh, cemetery layout. The graves are four feet by 11 feet. Um, but again, what you'll see is to date, we've planted over 400 trees now around Willow's Rest. Uh, some of them young whips, some of them are now six to eight feet. And my vision is 20, 25 years from now, um, I'll be able to walk into Willow's Rest and leave everything behind. Um, and we're experiencing that with the families that have been interested. So again, to get back to Candace's point, Green Burial has been a, a wonderful way to involve the families uh, that we deal with on a daily basis. Uh, the stories that we hear from our families um, and the level of involvement that we have with them and, and them in the act of, of interring their loved one is so much more than what we experience on a daily basis with our conventional burials. And it's something that I truly appreciate because from the very first burial, uh, Bert Gahn uh, was our very first burial. He was a young gentleman who died of cancer. And nearly every burial that we've had, uh, the family has shared very personal stories with us and we've stood graveside with them and participated in the burial. We've, we've ultimately become part of their family because we've been able to incorporate something that was very near and dear to them in our own conventional cemetery. So just a few images of, of what Willow's Rest is and, and, uh, and what, it, uh, or what it started out as, a wildflower meadow. But of course, over time, um, each, each species, each native species that was planted takes its turn pushing through um, and enjoying the benefits of, uh, of the, the lush soils. I want to get to community involvement. Willow's Rest has not only transformed our conventional cemetery in that it provides a, a two-acre natural habitat and an absolutely stunning area for people to sit and reflect on life, but it's also drawn the community into a cemetery um, in ways that I never imagined. We now have school groups that tour our cemetery and, and stop at Willow's Rest. They'll seed bomb the section. We'll work with students um, from elementary schools, teaching them about the benefit of native, native plant species um, and pollinators. So we also take the opportunity to teach them about birds and uh, bees, birds and the bees and butterflies. Um, and, and they walk away from cemeteries with, su with such a different feeling and a different appreciation than I ever had as, as a child growing up. Uh, cemeteries historically were you know, off limits, but now we're opening our gates, we're bringing uh, members of the community in, nature clubs, bird watchers, kids that want to learn about uh, uh, native gardens. Uh, we're seeing large groups coming through the cemetery to enjoy um, the beauty and the benefits of Willow's Rest. And uh, this is uh, one of the pictures of midsummer of the, uh, the Rubecchia in full bloom. So you can imagine with 15,000 wildflower seeds and plugs planted, um, the, the growth of, of butterflies and the bee populations has been exponential. And so again, community involvement has been overwhelming. We had a, a group come to us, a, bir a, bee, sorry, a beekeeping group, and they installed three beehives at the beginning of Willow's Rest. And shortly thereafter, the three beehives grew to nine beehives and then 16 beehives by the second, uh, by the second year. And as of last year, we were actually generating about, um, I think it was about 100 jars of honey that we now turn around and sell, um, or we give a, a jar to the, the family that purchases a grave in Willow's Rest. And for anyone else, they can purchase a jar of this honey and all proceeds of the honey created from 
the, the bees in our cemetery actually goes towards feeding programs. Um, so again, the community involvement has been incredible. Um, um, the, oh, here's a, here's a picture of the, the three beehives when they were first installed at the, at the back end of uh, Willow's Rest. And again, we have kids that are coming through Willow's Rest learning about bees and the importance of the pollinators. So I, I don't want to take too much time. Um, what I'd like to stress, uh, um, um, you know, a point that Candace made, it's not always easy uh, developing something, and I'll call it new, even though we know it's not new. Um, sometimes there are, are hurdles that we have to face, but you know, when we have evenings such as this and we get the opportunity to speak to like-minded individuals, um, when, you sh when, you, when you take an opportunity to start speaking to environmental groups and, and uh, local groups that, you know, school groups or um, uh, nature clubs, you'll find that the support for developing green burial sites is growing rapidly. Um, I'll just quickly speak to our sales. When we first developed Willow's Rest, I anticipated that it would be five or six years of education before lots were truly sold. Um, but as I mentioned, one of our, our very first burial, in fact, took place uh, before Willow's Rest was even fully developed because the gentleman was adamant that we develop a green burial site and he be the first interment. Uh, so on our memorial stone, we have large memorial stones in a centralized area. Uh, Bert's name is engraved there. And the number one is beside his name because, like I said, he was adamant that he was going to be the first in. Um, so I encourage everyone, uh, community-wide, you know, nationwide, countrywide, um, speak to the people that truly are impassioned by nature and they will be the driving force behind the development of a, of a hybrid uh, green burial site or a standalone, uh, which we hope to develop in the, in the very near future. So again, I thank you very much for your time. I know that's a lot of information and I've missed a lot that I'd love to say, but uh, I'll, I'll leave it uh, to the question period. Thanks, Mark. Don't go away. There will be questions and answers. Thank and you. Uh, yeah, testament to it being a, a sanctuary both for the living and the dead. Um, now, the, the last hybrid operator we're going to hear from is Joshua Atkinson, and he's from Memorial Lakeview Mortuary and Cemetery in the foothills of um, Bountiful, Utah. And rather than cut down the scrub oak native to the region, they created a hybrid in 2008. And he's, amongst other things, has some interesting marketing, um, um, interesting marketing approach. So Joshua, over to you. Thank you. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. I'm going to do a screen share here. Um, give me just one second. Let's see. Hang on. Sorry. Okay. Can you guys see that? The, the green burial at uh, Lakeview Mortuary and Cemetery? Yep. Okay, perfect. You can make it full screen if you want to. Sorry? Make it full screen. Uh, yeah. Sorry, I, I don't, I'm not used to this. <laughs> don't worry, we're behind schedule. So just that we can still see it clearly. That's fine. Just go, go, okay. go for it, Josh. Can you see that image okay? No, oh, now we see your no, email. Now we see your email. That was good before. Don't worry. Let's see. Sorry. <laughs> This is the one I'm trying to get. All right. Okay, I'll just get started. So anyway, thank you for having me. It's, it's, a, it's a pleasure to join this group for the first time. Um, as you mentioned, uh, we are in the foothills of Bountiful, Utah. It's a beautiful uh, community that uh, we're in. Uh, I work for a company called Memorial Mortuaries and Cemeteries. Um, just a little bit about me. I've been in the business for about 13 years. Um, been on the pre-need uh, side of the business for a long time, so I'm going to talk a little bit about marketing and um, how to how to promote your your, hy your hybrid green cemetery or your green your green cemetery if it's a standalone location in that uh, regard. Um, we at Memorial Estates and Memorial Mortuaries and Cemeteries we've uh, been in the in the cemetery business um, since the probably the early 1950s. We have five beautiful cemeteries. Um, and we uh, kind of foresaw the need 
to establish a grain burial uh, back in 2009. Um, so we, we've been operating our hybrid grain cemetery for a little over 10 years now. Um, some interesting things about, um, you know, from our experience being in the green uh, cemetery business is that initially it, it wasn't uh, very well received and, and mainly because we, we kind of imagined that uh, some people weren't just used to the concept or, or maybe hadn't heard of it or what, maybe weren't very educated um, about how the green burial process works and, and why it makes sense uh, to a lot of people um, and then the lifestyle aspect of it. Um, so from 2009 until 2011, we only experienced one burial. Um, and it was a real slow start. We, we put out a lot of marketing effort, a lot of grassroots, grassroots uh, trades, uh, trade show uh, style marketing and had a lot of people show interest in it. Um, but when it came down to you know, actually performing a burial, families would oftentimes veer away from the green burial concept, mainly because it was something that was new um, and maybe you know, not acceptable to maybe other members of their family. And so, um, like I said, it took about a couple, two to three years to, to establish our first uh, real official green burial in, our, in uh, our green burial section of our cemetery. Um, an interesting thing about that is from 2011 to 2017, um, so another you know, five or so years, we only did another three burials and pre-sold seven uh, pre-need graves in that section. Um, and then in the last, uh, the last really last three, two, three years, from really from 2018 until now, we've pre-sold 45 graves in that section. Um, and then we've done another seven burials. So uh, it's really sort of taken off um, in terms of, you know, the popularity and the concept of green burial, um, aside from traditional burial in our, in our cemetery. Just going to show a uh, Sorry, I'm, I apologize if my screen share is not working the way I'm wanting it to. Um, wanted to share another image, just a Google image. Um, uh, it's not pulling up here. Uh, sorry. Um, I'm having difficulty, I'm sorry. Um, we've, we've taken a portion of our cemetery um, that has a lot of, a lot of uh, shrub oak and big tooth maple and it was really um, an area that we didn't want to destroy that foliage and that shrub and, and ground, um, ground foliage. So that's kind of the area that we decided to, to place our, our green cemetery in. Um, when people walk into the forest part of the, the, the big tooth maple and the, 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 the shrub oak, oftentimes you can tell just by the look of, on their face that um, you know they're not they're a little unsure if they want to bury their loved one in this in this natural forested area compared to the you know the beautifully manicured lawn um, right next door and oftentimes it's a contemplation um, of whether or not they want to do it and and you know what we try to explain to them is you know hey this is this is a lifestyle choice um, you know for your loved one and, and you and your family um, this oftentimes isn't a cheaper option sometimes people think uh, the green burial option is going to be a less expensive uh, way to burial when in fact it's not. Um, as mentioned earlier, um, we do a lot of the things um, that were mentioned earlier like uh, you know hand dug graves. We don't allow heavy equipment to go into the area. Number one to protect the foliage and the trees and such um, but also to try to main maintain and establish that that true green burial um, in the area. Um, vaults are uh, Concrete barrel vaults are not allowed. We require um, a standard uh, kind of a wicker casket or um, a, a shroud of, of sorts um, for, the, for the deceased to be placed into. Um, and, and so um, when it comes to part of our marketing strategy, um, what we found is in, in these grassroots events, um, the wicker casket has been a really interesting um, item or object to take to our grassroots events. Um, we've taken all sorts of other items to display in our booth at many of the trade shows and, and things that we do. And none of those objects get as much attention as the wicker casket does. Um, you know, as, as many of you know, it looks sort of like a Moses basket. 
um, and is really unique and different from what people are used to seeing. And so it really draws a lot of attention to uh, our booth that otherwise we would not have gotten that, that, that attention. Um, in fact, one time we had a, a booth set up and uh, our a competitor mortuary had set up a booth really right across the aisle from us at this trade show event. And they brought a traditional metal casket. And it was, it was really crazy to see how many people really veered away from their booth and did not want to stop and talk to them. But people flocked to our booth because we had the wicker casket. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the comments made um, when we display the wicker casket are, oh my gosh, that's exactly what I want. Or, you know, oh my gosh, you know, it's a Moses basket, look. And then they come around it and they start to examine it and touch it and feel it. And of course, you know, it's a hands-on display. So we let people, you know, take a look at it. Um, so if you're looking to promote your green, your green burial efforts, um, be it, um, for, you know, from the burial all the way um, down to handling a green funeral service, um, and you really want to get people talking and, and people interested, take a wicker casket. They're not very expensive to buy for display purposes. Um, take those to all of your events because everybody just absolutely loves them. And it's a great point of conversation uh, to have uh, with folks that otherwise didn't come to, you know, a farmer's market to talk about prepaid funerals and prepaid burials or to the boat show or the home show or any other trade show that you're at. They, they certainly didn't come to have that conversation, but when you have that there as your display, it really um, piques their interest and, and causes a lot of conversation that you know, they wouldn't have otherwise had. Um, when it comes to um, you know, the green burial for us as a company, it's been um, quite a success over the last couple of years. Um, we, we, we do a lot of online marketing uh, here in the Salt Lake Market and the majority of our leads coming in at this day and time are regarding green burial. So we found, you know, we found that um, this is something that is on people's minds. We believe that the, the marketing efforts um, of you know, those that have come before us and for us over the last 10 to 11 years um, are starting to pay off in that people are generally starting to accept it. Um, I was telling Susan the other, uh, the other day when we were talking on the phone that um, we, we occasionally will have a burial um, in the Green Cemetery. And you can, I watch people's faces uh, at the Green Cemetery burials. And it's interesting to see people's reaction when the casket is sitting there um, over the hand dug grave, um, rested upon three you know, natural logs with some hemp rope ready to lower it down. It's interesting to see people's faces um, as they're there witnessing that burial and oftentimes witnessing the lowering of the casket down into the grave. Um, sometimes you can see the look of curiosity, like, wow, this is something new. This is something I've never seen. Sometimes you can see those awkward looks, like you can tell that they're thinking maybe this is weird or this is strange or this is different. Um, we've even had families um, feel it necessary to make a comment either before or after the burial to the family that's there and saying, hey, you know, we're sorry this is kind of a strange setting. This is what our mom or our dad wanted. They really wanted to be in this natural green setting. In fact, I've had people say, it's not what we would have done for dad, but this is really what he wanted. It's interesting to me that they feel it necessary to make that, that, uh, that comment to their family, um, feeling as if so that they need to apologize in some way um, when in fact they, they certainly don't. Um, I've had families sitting around the grave side <laughs> and, uh, suits and, shoes. And, and it's interesting to see that after the caskets lowered um, they all want to take part in you know backfilling the grave and so the shovels come out and the expensive shoes are getting dirty and, and dirt's kind of flying around and it, it's really neat to see kind of the, the kind of the more holistic approach that comes out of people that I, I don't think otherwise that would have happened at a traditional uh, burial. So it really kind of brings people um, back to nature, back to kind of a, a holistic approach to you know what a burial was like you know maybe a hundred plus years ago. Um, so that's really something unique about the green cemeteries um, that, that we experience on a day-to-day -day basis now. 
as we're, we're taking families out into the, the, the green cemetery and showing them the graves and such. Uh, one of the challenges that we have with having our green cemetery in a natural forest part of our cemetery is we're getting a lot of people that want to go out there and look for graves. And what we're noticing is the natural foliage is beginning to sort of fade away, like they're sort of tromping it down. So we're having to adjust a little bit and create um, some stone paths where we want to direct people to walk um, in order to sort of preserve, you know, the natural gro uh, ground cover um, that's in the trees. Uh, for, the, the, for many of you that, that have that sort of a, an establishment on your, in your cemeteries, um, the low sunlight causes it, you know, to be a little bit more difficult to grow ground cover. And so what you have, you don't want to lose. So um, if, if you have, you know, a forest situation like we do, and you're trying to preserve that ground cover, make sure you establish walking paths uh, to keep people in the areas that you, you know, want them to be able to, you know, view uh, the areas that are for sale and then also preserving the areas where the actual burials are going to take place. Um, Josh, I think I'm going to have to cut you off okay. now. No problem. No I'm problem. so sorry. Just so we get to the, um, hopefully that subject, whatever you were going to say comes up in the Q&A, but we still have um, an advocate and two funeral directors. So now um, I'm going to introduce um, Joe Smolensky is, um, where are my notes here? Um, was is a funeral director, fourth generation funeral home owner of Renaissance Funerals and Crematory in Raleigh, North Carolina. And if you were here earlier, we were talking about he was one of the stars, so to speak, in the in the wonderful documentary A Will for the Woods. Joe, over to you. Say, Susan, thank you, thank you. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I'll try to make this quick. Um, I, I wanted to take a different approach. Obviously, with me being a funeral director, I'll just give you some experience and some numbers on my end. Um, as far as burials go, about 10 to 20% of our burials are green burials. And that's with two green cemeteries, both within 16 miles of us. Um, so, um, you know, it, it, it fluctuates 10 to 20%. It's hard to say, you know, this year what it's going to be or next year, but that's the fluctuation. 10 to 20% of all our burials are green burials. And in 2011, when we started, we supported natural burials simply by using cardboard cremation containers or Jewish caskets or Jewish shrouds. So you don't have to, you don't have to go out and get these uh, green items that are labeled green because there are a lot of green items you, you're already using as a funeral and, um, you know, having a funeral, I'm sorry, having a cemetery local, a green cemetery, is really an advantage. Um, you know, I, I think what I noticed once we had one green cemetery and then we had another, and from the phone calls we get from outside our area, we're in Raleigh. So we have a tri-city area, and it's, it's a medium-sized city. Um, you know, we get calls from up to 25 miles away in some cases. And um, about 90% of all of the folks that are interested in green burial are willing to travel within 25 miles. Outside of the 25 mile radius, it gets more difficult, I think, for people to balance the, uh, the choice of green burial with the inconvenience of travel and distance. So those though that have a really strong belief about the environment or the green movement, they will make an effort to go even up to 50 miles. But beyond 50 miles, we don't see any activity. Um, I, I, I do recall the days when we did not have any green cemeteries nearby. Um, funeral homes are just simply not gonna support the movement because it's, like, it's just out of sight, out of mind. And you know, the community desire will build um, as long as there's a cemetery support and organizational support, um, and, and that has to be publicized. We did have great uh, publicity through news, um, articles, and um, the Green Burial Council, and Facebook and social media, of course, really helped. And, and about a year after the Green Burial Cemetery uh, was built, and again, that's about 16 miles away, 
about a year later is when we saw a notable increase in green burial interest. Um, what I have noticed, just a few, just a couple last points, families that are unsure of burial or cremation seem to be the ones more open to green burial. You know, a lot of times we get families, they don't know what they want. Um, those are the ones that are more open to green burial. It is rare, let's say it's rare, I shouldn't say that, but it seems to be more common that we transition a decision of a family um, when we get into the discussion of burial, cremation, and, and then now green burial is an option. I don't think people um, uh, you know, publicly understand what green burial is until there's a death for, for, for our case in most cases. Um, I think families that are not choosing, families are not choosing green burial for money purposes. I think if money's an issue, normally the choice is cremation. My experience is that green burial is chosen because of the meaning associated with it. They choose green burial because it's honoring the life of that person better than any other option. And it could be the simple life that they lived. It could be they, that they were an environmentally conscious person or they simply had a love for the outdoors, love for nature or animals. Um, so I hope those were some good bits and points, but um, that's what I've got. Thank you guys. Thanks, Joe. Thanks for that consumer perspective. That's really interesting. And now I'm going to call upon Sean out in California, who has, and she's a midwife, funeral celebrant, and uh, funeral director, and owner founder of DIY Dying, um, a licensed funeral establishment in Long Beach, California, which offers before and after death care services and living and home funerals and green burials, of course. She's also on the board of GBC. Sean. Hello everyone. Hi Susan, thank you for having me. Um, I, um, as she mentioned, I am the owner of DIY Dying, which um, a little bit about my background I, um, before I get to that is um, I've been in the funeral industry since 2006 and um, I started at a little ma and pa type cremation provider um, and over the time that I was there we grew the business uh, exponentially. I mean, we went from 20 cases a month to over 350 cases a month for cremation. So the demand for that option here in Southern California is, is the highest demand. Um, it's about 67% the last time I checked. Um, from being with the Ma and Pa funeral home, I was then recruited to a corporate owned funeral home who is mainly pre-need driven and they were pushing, um, pre-need cremation sales. Um, at that point, at a, a few years into that, I lost my brother. Um, and prior to his passing, I wanted to bring him home and care for him at home and get the family involved. And um, unfortunately, my sister-in-law didn't go for that. But um, that got me on the trajectory that I'm on now, which is in trying to provide family-driven service where um, the alternatives the options that I offer are more family driven focus. So with green burial, um, family could partake in the home funeral, the caring for the dead, the preparation of the body, um, then the opening and closing of the grave at the cemeteries. So that's the main, uh, my main passion in my own business um, that I try to push. And I offer both on land and at sea. Um, being here off the coast of California, I'm fortunate enough to offer full body burial at sea. Um, so that's another green version. Um, the uh, demand for green burial I'm finding is growing here in Southern California. Um, the more and more people start to get into the death midwifery type of services and the, the family driven services, they're looking for those alternative options. And um, we have a lot of eco-friendly type of people um, here in LA County. The only um, downside of our situation is, is that we're limited on the green cemeteries. Um, the options for green cemetery burial here in SoCal is, is down to about three cemeteries um, and all of which are a little bit of a drive for some people here. Joshua, we, Joshua Tree being the um, least expensive option of the three is the furthest 
for us. Um, then the next one goes up into um, Central California. Um, but I do find that there is the interest and um, it is what I, I love for families to, to learn that it is an option that's out there. So I advocate that mainly here um, through my business is the green options. And I have got inquiries for um, family members that are aware of the limitations on the cemetery options here in SoCal. So they're willing to, to be transported to cemeteries that offer what it is they were looking for. Um, I did have a family recently that has a loved one who wants to go into a nature preserve or a cemetery that's, pre excuse me, that's preserving the land um, with no markers and everything is, is just beautiful forestry is there versus say a green cemetery in a desert. Um, and I looked it up and it's totally feasible and I can transport her when she's ready to go. So um, we did a pre-need for that. Um, another thing that I wanted to mention is that with the Green Burial Council, I, I handle the funeral home certifications. So those funeral homes that are in and throughout the US and Canada that are interested in, in becoming green burial certified and offering these types of services to their families, um, I would be your liaison. So I'd walk you through the process and assist you in creating these options or um, going through the options that you currently provide to make sure that they're up to our standards and then we give you the seal of approval. Um, and if you're interested in any of that information, feel free to reach out. Um, thanks again, Susan. I don't want to take up too much time. So, Thank you, Sean. Thank you. Uh, now we're going to call upon an advocate out there promoting green burial in her um, area of Lebanon and New Hampshire. Caitlin is on the board of GBC and is a scientist with a PhD in microbiology and immunology. So she's our go-to with any science questions um, that come up like the soil, that kind of thing. At any rate, Caitlin, over to you. Thank you. Yeah, so I'm a Green Burial Council member as of just earlier this year, but I've been on the board of cemetery trustees for the city of Lebanon for two years now. And about in the past year or so, we've been working on or I've been working on assisting the trustees to alter their current municipal bylaws, which currently dictate that burials must include the use of a concrete vault. Um, so the city has asked this, the trustees to look into the feasibility of green or natural burial, and, and that would result in changing the bylaws to eliminate needing that vault, but also including language specifically for addressing green burials in terms of what that looks like for our city, how it's done, at what cost, things like that. Um, admittedly, it's been quite slow going thus far. Um, green burial has been an interest to members of the community for some time, um, and it's in line with the city's efforts to be sort of more eco and energy conscious. But I would say that the biggest roadblock has been sort of breaking down some of the preconceived notions of what it means to have a green burial and, and what that process could look like in one of our own cemeteries. And I think sometimes um, folks forget that by changing the bylaws and getting, giving citizens of our city more choices for burial, that doesn't necessarily mean that they themselves have to like or want that option too. Um, but I will say, thankfully, we have some wonderful community members that are advocating for bur green burial for the city. They, I've noticed some of them are on this call tonight, so thank you. Um, they've been very supportive of, at trustee meetings and getting green burial to move forward. I think having that community voice as well as insight from folks familiar with green burial in other communities, I know Pat Keeley we've reached out to recently, um, is really critical in moving the needle forward on making this change at a municipal level. And I think um, another huge consideration in my particular situation and probably also elsewhere is uh, meeting cemetery workers and concerned citizens where they are and finding a way to form a hybrid cemetery with a green burial option that satisfies families as best as possible and also meets the needs of all these other parties that are involved. Um, we also are lucky in that we have a deputy city manager that's been instrumental, particularly recently, in kind of reining in the board a little bit and um, getting the green barrel discussion back on track. So 
overall, I'm hoping by the next time I get asked to talk on a peer-to-peer, -peer, I can tell you that we have successfully managed to get green burial in the bylaws for the city of Lebanon in Lebanon, New Hampshire. So fingers crossed. Thank you, Caitlin. Good point about how we can't assume that the people that we're advocating to are going to like it as much as we like the idea. Um, good. Now, so uh, we had intended there to be a balance, sort of the, the speakers at the beginning and the Q&A at the end. I don't know if people are, are able to stay on for 10 more minutes, then we can at least field some of the questions if the speakers can stay on. But for those of you who have to go, I want to say thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you to all the speakers. Thank you, thank you to the donors. And also, um, we hope to see you in October. There's the, the conference that you'll find on our website. And we will be following up with an email. But if, if everybody's OK, if, if they can, uh, are free to stay for 10 more minutes, why don't we get at least some of the questions in? Sound like a plan? Hopefully good. Are you ready for me? Am I unmuted? Okay. Um, I'm just going to uh, combine two that I think uh, have a, a relationship. One is um, what is the water table level? That was asked when um, Patrick was talking. Are there underwater springs? And then someone else wanted to know, uh, Trudy wanted to know about tree roots. What do you do about tree roots? So um, those are kind of related underground questions if somebody wants to take those. Well, Patrick, if it came up during your, your talk, do you want to field that one? Sure. Um, Quickly? We, we, <laughs> yes, yes, we do have some underground springs and we will try to pump them out. Um, but where we're putting our uh, one that we have, uh, there's no, no issue. It's on top of a hill on a hillside. So there's, there's no water table to worry about there. But we do have parts of the cemetery if we decide to have green burials there that we're going to have to try to figure out the water situation. And Josh, what about the tree roots? Yeah, the tree roots are very interesting. Most people want to be buried either right next to the root or, or actually underneath the root. So because of the hand dug nature of the, the burial, um, our guys can actually get in there with shovels and partially dig under the root system. You know, not to, not to you know, cut any roots of the tree, you know, as much as possible. But that's been a request of several people to partially place their remains underneath the tree so that, you know, in essence, they can be one with the tree. So we, we, we totally embrace, embrace that as much as we can. And just um, let, let me also add regarding the tree roots, Mount Auburn Cemetery is also an arboretum in Cambridge, Massachusetts. So they're dealing with tree roots all the time. And they take a different approach. They will start to dig uh, a grave, perhaps near a tree. And if it's a really large root, they may have to move the grave. But in some instances, they can actually make a clean cut. They bring the arborist in to say, hey, make a clean cut of this tree root. And let's just keep taking care of the tree. So even if you have tree roots, it does not mean you can't have a green burial. Thank you. Um, so but some of the questions are getting asked uh, and answered in the chat and uh, we will uh, send more information afterwards, but I just wanna say there were a lot of comments for Mark about how absolutely beautiful the Niagara Falls uh, Cemetery is and appreciation for the bees and optimizing the land. Some, uh, Liz asked though, uh, are dogs allowed? Uh, there are apparently a lot of uh, dog walkers in her city uh, cemetery. So she wanted to know that from Mark. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it's a bit of a double-edged sword. So we do have our regulars who bring their dogs through the cemetery. Uh, I myself own a Great Dane uh, and he is regularly at the office with me. Um, but we do have signs up uh, because of the uh, pet owners that don't clean up after their after their pets um, that have caused a, a great deal of stress for um, the people visiting their loved ones and they find uh, droppings on their graves. Um, so we we recognize our regulars and we don't enforce the rules strictly, uh, but we do keep a close eye on the people uh, who are not uh, following the rules. <laughs> And, and while you're up, there was another question. Glenn wanted to know what kind of green markers you offer. 
Uh, so the way Willow's, Willow's Rest is designed, there's a central circle uh, with a memorial garden, and we have placed a large limestone. Uh, it's a it's actually a limestone offcut uh, to a quarry that uh, um, provided some of the, the uh, greatest limestone across Canada. Um, it's now closed and it's being remediated, uh, but all of their offcut pieces they provide to us. Uh, so rather than having individual memorialization, we have this centralized memorial circle and the names of the loved ones are engraved on those, those pieces of limestone. Thank you. There were some, um, a number of questions about uh, concern about the body freezing um, and that's come up again now. Um, and I think this was uh, aimed for Patrick primarily. He was talking about uh, the winter, although Niagara Falls, I'm sure you're dealing with that too. Um, so either, I would say either one of you, if you could kind of speak to that. Our basic concern is that we just want to make sure that the, the process starts as soon as possible. And, and the decomposition process does start as soon as you die. So we don't want to, we don't want to lapse in time. I personally, I, I would say, I don't want my grandmother in the hole frozen. I'd rather just have her decomposing the way she should be. And, uh, and quickly, we've run into the issue, uh, sorry, not we, um, we actually find opening graves in the winter easier uh, than in uh, the spring or fall because it's a lot easier to crack open um, the earth when it's frozen than it is when it's uh, uh, saturated with water. Um, we've had this conversation with a number of different communities in Ontario, uh, certainly northern Ontario. Uh, in fact, uh, I'm, I'm seeing Jenny uh, commenting about Halliburton. Um, and we have uh, identified ways, actually Patrick spoke about this, placing bays of, uh, or hail, uh, bales of hay over top of uh, grave sites so that they can be opened. Um, so it's something that we're working through with uh, various communities that are asking how to open a grave in the winter. Um, another question, this one from Candace, to all three of the cemetery uh, operators, do you allow pets to be buried in the cemeteries also? I can speak to that. So we, we have a designated pet garden um, that's, that is uh, in a separate section. Uh, okay. Mark, Patrick? Uh, Patrick, Patrick's answer is unofficially yes. Okay. <laughs> Don't quote me. <laughs> Um, and along those lines, in Ontario, uh, Canada, it is not legal to inter a pet in a, in a cemetery. Um, but off the record, we often tell families what we don't know, we can't police. Uh, so. Gotcha. Um, Cam CG was the, the, uh, the byline. Uh, wanted to know what kind of irrigation is proper for a green burial cemetery. I'll speak to that real quick in ours. We, we, don't, we don't irrigate at all. Our, our forest part of our cemetery. It's just natural, natural rainfall is all the, the irrigation that it gets. Yeah, I, I would echo that, that comment that the plant selection, if you're developing a site, um, uh, the plant selection would be of native species that don't require irrigation. So essentially you're zero escaping a, a, a green burial site. And then uh, let's see, uh, Norma wondered uh, what about the expectation of some people that the green area would be mowed just like the rest of the cemetery. How do you address that? Well, before I sell a lot, I bring them right to the lot and I sh tell them exactly how it's going to look if, it, if they can't tell from that time of year. Um, and then if they want one that's mowed, then we are looking at to do, to do that too. I, I would say the same, and, uh, and I'm sorry, I can't recall who spoke to it, but uh, people purchasing in a green burial site or a natural burial ground are... Um, fully aware that this area is going to be left in a natural state. And in fact, that's why they're coming to, to, um, to purchase or to, to uh, participate in that. Um, and what I will say with respect to maintenance is, um, you know, there are alternatives to, to maintaining a green burial site you know, with respect to controlled burns and 
um, you know, seed collection, those types of things. And, and again, the families have been fully supportive of, of those efforts as well. Great. I'll echo Patrick real quick in that it's, it's super important to take the family out to this space. Um, you know, trying to sell them sight unseen oftentimes can lead to disappointment. So taking the family out to the, to the area that's you know, specific to what they're wanting is, is important. So, so um, there were a couple other interesting comments. Um, Joe was talking about uh, that 10 to 20 percent of uh, their uh, funeral, their clients were looking for green um, burial. And then Rachel, who's here in Portland at Riverview, mentioned that um, a third of, of theirs are green and it's slightly higher for prearrangements. Um, when uh, Joe was talking about people not wanting to go too far away, um, about 25 miles. Uh, C. Hatch mentioned that his burial spot is six hours from where he lives. And uh, I know he had an earlier question. I'm trying to read my own <laughs> handwriting, which is apparently not very good these days. Um, Let's see. Uh, well, here's one from Mary. She was asking, um, how do you set interment procedures to ensure that there are no encroachments? Uh, and there was some further conversation around that on the chat. But if any of you want to address that. Um, we have a, a lot pin system in our, so just like our standard, you know, traditional burial out in the, you know, the manicured lawn areas. Um, in those areas, there's a stainless steel pin that establishes a 16 lot um, area. Um, and so we've, we've kind of taken that same model um, and used it in our green cemetery, um, except for our pin is, a, is an engraved rock. So the rock is sort of established in the middle of the, the 16 spaces. And that allows our guys to be able to measure each area off to ensure that they're, you know, digging the right grave and, and using uh, using the right parameters to dig the grave. Um, we dig our graves a little bit wider. Uh, they're about four feet wide by eight feet. Um, and that also helps to ensure that when we're digging the next one, um, that we're not going to be hitting any, you know, physical remains of sorts. So. Um, the question from C. Hatch was, uh, are you getting requests for space for cremations in the green burial areas? Yes. Um, actually, we started a portion of our, uh, in the we call it Woodland Gardens, uh, 25 years ago, and it's for cremation. And in Vermont, our cremation rate is almost up to 65%. So we do have a, a spot for cremation in the woods, but we're also allowing them to be in our natural burial section. Okay. Um, lots more questions coming in. So much interest. Uh, Bridget, who is a mortuary science student, uh, wondered what can future graduates expect for the industry in the future? It's a great question. Anybody want to take that one on? Joe, Sean? I would uh, imagine that, um, at, again, total opinion here, but uh, more in the way of um, renewing what our bodies are, are made to give uh, back to nature. So green burial um, was an, an added form of disposition more recently, but what about um, composting, human composting, um, alkaline hydrolysis or water cremation? You know, those are all some of the new and upcoming ways I think will um, develop. Uh, so I, that's what I would expect to see. I, I agree. I also want to say that the funeral industry has is, is, is got to grow with this growth and that families are wanting more hands-on type of services and don't want all the bells and whistles that most funeral homes sell. Um, so as a graduate, as a mortuary science student, to know that the industry is changing 
and um, that we all need to change with it. Thanks, Sean. And the, um, James, sorry. Go, go ahead. Um, so speaking of adaptability, um, we in uh, prior to COVID, we had purchased uh, five large canopies to try to promote graveside burials services uh, within our funeral home and didn't see a lot of traction in the use of those, except for when COVID hit, we now had a solution to being able to provide services outdoors in a large capacity to many families that we wouldn't have been able to do so um, if we hadn't have made that ad adaptation uh, prior to COVID. So I believe the funeral, the funeral home industry is a little bit uh, La uh, sorry, behind a little bit when it comes to technology and, and being up to speed on, you know, current things. But, you know, we are adapting and, and do have that capacity, so. Um, do we have time for one more, Susan? Is there one more? Yeah. Last question. Last okay. question. So Kay Amaranth asks, are anyone cemeteries affiliated with specific faith communities? She's curious about, she or he, is curious about integration of conventional cemeteries and green burial. Well, we, we are looking at, at um, ch changing uh, parts of uh, the cemetery into the ability to have green burial. Um, we also have a section with the local synagogue who um, would prefer not to use vaults, so we're looking at that. So um, we do... Um, we do have a connection with a, with a faith. Thanks, Patrick. And I know the chair of um, uh, GBC was saying the other day that he, at one of his cemeteries, um, a Muslim community purchased 300 plots right in a natural burial ground. So there are religious groups that are, are looking for this opportunity. If I can just throw a quick point in about that. Uh, we were speaking about community involvement. Um, but we can also look at it from a religious aspect. Um, there was a presentation in Northern Ontario um, hosted by the Muslim community, uh, organized by the Catholic community. Uh, so two, <laughs> two faiths came together uh, to talk to us about green burials. So it's been a wonderful development there. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. I'm sorry we took you over the- I have a question. Could I ask one question? Sure you can. All right. As being a grave digger and in a conventional cemetery, it was a guy that said he had a natural burial. And the guy said, where at? And he said, such a cemetery. He said, well, I thought they required a vault. And he said, they do require vaults, but they told us at the vault company to leave the lid and carry the base and they put the body on the ground, making ground contact. and flip the vault over as a dome cake plate and put it in there to meet the requirements where it could be buried in the conventional part where they had already purchased a grave plot. So I can, I can speak to that a little bit. We right. don't allow it within the green burial standards. That's right. And, and that's because it, it's basically, um, it has a carbon footprint associated with that vault. The it's vault. not going to, it's not going to decompose in the ground. And uh, the council sees that this is something that's not necessary to go into the ground. So that's why it doesn't meet the standards. But if, if that's the, the, the closest that your cemetery can get to doing a green burial, then then do it, you know, provide for your customer as best you can. That's right. As being popular now, it wasn't popular at the time when the mm -hmm. spouse had died and the other person wanted to go as a natural way to be buried beside of it. That's the way some people decide to be. Yeah. Buried. They, but that wouldn't be, I understand what you said also about it not meeting the specifications of being a natural or green bird. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's a good question to ask. Thank you for bringing it up. Thank you. Okay, thank you, everybody. We will thank be you, following Susan. up with Thank you, Susan. Questions. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Take care. Bye.